Okay, welcome to Lecture 6, The Counter-Reformation, The Church Strikes Back. So we're going to be picking up where we left off last time, uh, where we just introduced Martin Luther, and uh, all of the exciting change that's sweeping over Europe is just going to pick up speed and roll onward. So here we go. Okay, so last time when we focused on Luther, uh, we talked a little bit about how Luther's views differed from those of the Catholic Church, and he's going to spell those out, and there's going to be a great wave of people who are going to band behind Luther, who come to be known as Lutherans, logically enough. But Luther was not by any stretch of the imagination the only person who was breaking with the Church at this time. We already mentioned Ulrich Zwingli a little bit, who set up shop in Switzerland, He's not going to be the only one who does that. But in fact, Luther, uh, what Luther does by uh, breaking with the Catholic Church and getting away with it through the intercession of Frederick the Wise is he really just sets a match to a fire that had already been laid, that had already been set up and ready to go. And lots of other people are going to jump on it. Many are going to kind of join with Luther, especially those who have political motivations and like to align themselves with political leaders like Frederick. Frederick the Wise, Duke of Saxony, or other vassals of the Holy Roman Emperor. But there are other people who don't really see themselves lining up with that kind of political leadership. They want to see something a little bit more extreme. And that's where we come to John Calvin. He agrees with Ulrich Zwingli uh, about the, the idea that the only way to truly break from the church is also to break from existing uh, political structures in the format that they currently exist. Instead, uh, the leadership of any new, reformed, purified Christian community is going to have to spring from the leadership of this new, reformed, purified Christian church. So John Calvin is going to promote that idea. He's originally French, and he's going to travel from France uh, to Geneva in Switzerland, much like Zwingli does, and set up something close to a theocratic community there. In other words, the leadership of his church is going to run everything about politics uh, as well. He's not able to do this completely, but he exerts quite a lot of influence. Um, and Calvin is important not just because he holds these views, and not just because those views become very popular with certain segments of Europe's population, uh, but because he also substantially differs from Luther on a few points of doctrine that will ultimately have a cultural impact and a political impact. So it's worth knowing what they are. Um, specifically, the one thing that we're going to focus on, is, although there are others, uh, is the doctrine of predestination. Now, last time I went on to something of a digression where I talked about, or really wasn't a digression, but it's something of a, a a, a bit of a, a long spiel about how um, Luther was an Augustinian monk and he studied the works of St. Augustine of Hippo, who was a bishop in the uh, early Christian church, fairly early, uh, who took on really big ideas about the universe and the cosmos and mankind and the nature of God and all of those big ideas. And uh, Luther wrestles with one idea in particular, the idea of free will and predestination, trying to reconcile the paradox of an omnipotent, omniscient God, a God who knows and, and controls everything, with the idea that humans can have free will. Luther lands on the same solution that St. Augustine did, which is that he just basically says, it's a paradox, don't worry about it too much, you'll just hurt your head, just don't think too hard about it. Calvin is going to look at that same question and come to a different conclusion. Calvin's going to take on this idea of the paradox, how God is all powerful in his view and God is all knowing in his view and not limited therefore by time. And therefore everything that is going to happen is already known by God and everything that is going to happen is already in a sense chosen by God to happen. It's a little more subtle than that, but for our purposes, he comes up with the doctrine of predestination. In other words, your destiny is already set. Everything that's going to happen has already happened in the mind of God, and so there's really nothing you can do to change it. And so whether you achieve salvation or not, whether you get to a, a good point in your afterlife, is already chosen for you. 
And there's really nothing you can do to alter that because like Luther, Calvin argues that humanity is not able to earn salvation because you are flawed and fallible by nature. Nothing you do could ever be good enough to deserve this ultimate, complete, perfect goodness that would be salvation. So you are either going to be saved or you're not. Uh, you're either going to uh, go to heaven or not. And this is already decided for you. And if you are in the group that's already going to heaven, Calvin would describe you as among the elect. And if you're not, well, sorry, you're not. Now, here's where it gets into having a social impact. Not only does he think this, but Calvin will argue that the best way to live your life uh, in order to make sure or to feel the most confidence that you are in the elect is to surround yourself by other people who also seem to be likely to be in the elect. But how can you know whether someone's in the elect chosen for salvation or not in the elect, not chosen for, for salvation, but rather for hell or some other unpleasant fate? Um, well, Calvin gives you some tips. He argues that you can look at a person and judge by their behavior, their demeanor, and their um, general success in life, whether they might be in the elect or not. In other words, if a person's behavior is in all ways correct, if they are modest and don't dress in flashy clothes that draw attention to themselves, if they are serious and sober, so they're not uh, out partying all the time or indulging in frivolous things. If they happily and willingly sit through long freaking sermons, um, the Calvinist churches were famous for these, um, and don't complain about it, they're likely to be in the elect. If they always uh, conduct themselves sort of carefully in a a proper sort of way. If their clothes are very, well, basically, if their clothes are plain and their uh, behavior is very serious and modest and uh, hardworking, then those people are likely to be in the elect. If on the contrasting side, you're somebody who dresses in a flashy way, if you're somebody who uh, indulges in obviously sinful behavior, if you are somebody who uh, values frivolous things or having a good time, if you're somebody who dances or has too much fun in public, then you're probably not in the elect. And nothing you can do can change that fate. That's just how it is, according to uh, Calvin. And so if you want to be in or feel like you're in the elect, then not only do you have to behave this way uh, as an elect person would, but you have to seek out other people who behave that way too. And what happens in Geneva is it becomes almost a competition where everyone's falling over themselves to show how elect they are. And so their clothes, this is where if you have a picture in your mind, we're getting to that season of the year um, from elementary school or elsewhere of like a pilgrim like pilgrim clothing, pilgrim hat, pilgrim shoes with the buckles, you know, the black. That image comes to us from Calvinist communities, the idea of wearing ex clothes of extreme plainness um, and extreme modesty is, is kind of part of this Calvinist movement to demonstrate that you are worthy and in the elect. Like Luther, Calvin promotes the idea that only scripture is the only authority that you should respect. And so therefore everyone needs to be able to read and preferably write, and the Bible needs to be translated into vernacular languages or local languages. Education is very highly prized and um, is promoted by all Protestant sects, really, but especially uh, Calvinists. And um, in addition to that, in addition to being expected to be studious, Calvinists, as I mentioned just a second ago, fall over themselves to show that their behavior is more correct than the next person, or at least as correct, and everybody's competing to be as correct as possible. So uh, Calvinist communities will uh, have either social or legal bans on things like dancing or on uh, playing music in a way that you could hear it um, outside. Um, the church services must have been very dull. Um, but um, they uh, could sort of compete with each other to have the strictest uh, puritanical. And this is where we get, um, when we refer to Puritans, from this time period. It's Calvinists that we're talking about. The strictest, most puritanical standards of behavior possible. 
Now, this is going to have serious uh, social and economic effects down the line as well. Part of the impact of this doctrine and the impact of this belief, if you think everyone's uh, status uh, in the elect or not in the elect is predestined, and if you think that people who uh, don't conduct themselves with dignity in other words, people who don't dress properly, people who don't uh, act with perfect sobriety all the time. Now, even Puritans don't generally uh, preach that you should give up alcohol. It's not often a possible thing to do in Europe. It's not safe. A lot of the other drinks that you might have drunk uh, were not necessarily safe for consumption because of water contamination. Uh, but um, nevertheless, if you're the kind of person who uh, might suffer or might struggle with this kind of thing, if you can't always dress properly, if you can't always um, behave your, in such a way as to never draw attention to yourself, if, for instance, you're very poor and you might need to beg, or if you have a drinking problem, or if you can't read and so therefore you can't really find much appeal in these church services, um, then... It's very unlikely in the view of Calvin and his followers that you're in the elect. So if you're the great majority of people in Europe who are in the uh, mostly agricultural still laboring poor, Calvin's overall view is that you're unlikely to be in the, in the chosen few, the people who have been selected for salvation. It's nothing that there's anything against farming. Many Calvinists are farmers. They're just more prosperous farmers. Uh, Calvinism, therefore, is going to appeal to certain types of people, generally more educated, generally town-dwelling, generally those who, um, we'll just talk about where they might live in just a moment, but generally those who are already more prosperous uh, than those who are not. And the Catholic Church is going to exploit this. The great majority of people are not going to find this terribly appealing because, number one, it's a very strict and, and sort of difficult way to live, although there is a certain appeal to what Calvin is pushing. Uh, his ideas of this very strict, morally upright behavior are in many ways a reaction to the excesses of the Catholic Church. And uh, I mean, when I say the Catholic Church, I mean, the popes who are keeping pet elephants and making huge lavishly decorated churches and everything is covered in gold uh, and, and Calvin's ideas push back against that and say that people should turn to a more spiritual purity and there are many people who are hungry for that they're hungry to hear somebody say that there is a reward for being morally upright that uh, this puts them on a special standing and footing it especially appeals to middle class people people in the high nobility have been living the the good fat of the land rich life for years they don't want to give that up and they like a doctrine like the catholic church pushes that they are nevertheless still the anointed of god but Calvinism is going to appeal, especially to people who are in this newly growing middle class, people who have some money, who've made some money on trade or crafts, if you're a, a master builder, or if you're um, a, a very highly placed banker or merchant or something like that, and you're prosperous, but you're honest, and you don't qualify as nobility, so you can't get away with the kind of uh, fast living that nobility gets away with. But at the same time, you want to mark yourself as different from the, the hoi polloi, the common herd of peasantry, then this is something that does appeal. Okay, so enough about Calvin, we're going to move on. There are other groups as well, and there's just too many to, ne to mention and name, but there's a collection of them, and it's made up of assorted different groups that all get lumped together under the name Anabaptists, and those are worth knowing about as well. Anabaptists are really kind of named by their enemies. They don't really call themselves Anabaptists ever. Um, these are the ancestors of Quakers and Shakers and Diggers and Leveler. There's a whole bunch of them, but um, the Quakers are probably the ones who are most familiar with the Society of Friends. Um, and these are people who also in the 1500s were ready. They were ready for the opening, for the door to crack open so they could break with the church and uh, really express some of their moral objection they had with some of the church's teachings, not just with the hierarchy of the church, but with what they saw as uh, the way the church was interpreting various uh, religious doctrine. And one of the reasons they get called the Anabaptists by their enemies, which means against baptism is because most of these groups get called that because they advocate adult baptism. 
So in other words, rather than baptizing an infant the minute you can, so that, you know, in case of accidental death, they don't go to hell, uh, the Anabaptists argue that you should never swear an oath unless you are positive you can keep it. You should never make a promise that is witnessed by God unless you truly mean it. And if, because if you break that kind of a promise, you endanger your soul. You may condemn yourself to hell. And so you can't promise on behalf of an infant that they uh, want to follow the teachings of God and, and be part of a church. And so you have to wait until they get to the point where they're old enough to make a choice for themselves. So that's how they get the name Anabaptists. This reluctance to swear oaths extends to other parts of life as well. Anabaptists don't like to take oaths of loyalty to political figures for that reason. Uh, if they were modern people, these would be uh, among the groups who object to uh, taking the Pledge of Allegiance, for instance. They're not going to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, because what if America starts slaughtering babies or something, and then the Anabaptists can't, in moral co good moral conscience, be both loyal to the government of the United States and loyal to their moral principles. Uh, this would be a terrible bind to find themselves in. And if they were to break their oath, Anabaptists strongly believe they'll go to hell. And so therefore, uh, in that kind of a situation, the wisest thing is to never take an oath like that. As you can imagine, this makes uh, political leaders really nervous, especially in a time when uh, there's deep, deep divisions forming between people who are loyal to the Catholics and the Holy Roman Emperor, people who are loyal to local vassals and the Lutheran Church, people who are following off after Calvin eventually down the line. It's, it's a, a really disrupted time where people's loyalties are pulled in two directions and everybody on both sides is looking for a firm declaration of any group of people they come across. Are you our friends? Are you our enemies? Where do you stand? And when the Anabaptists say, um, we're, we're not, we're just not going to swear loyalty to anybody. This infuriates both sides. And so this is one of those odd points about the conflicts, religious conflicts that are going to dominate the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, all three really, is that they don't really fall down along strict religious lines. It's not just as simple as Catholic versus Protestant. For instance, the Lutherans and the Catholics are going to join together to go after Anabaptists. And this is a particularly nasty thing to do when you consider that most Anabaptist sects, in addition to not swearing oaths, um, also decide to take quite literally uh, the commandments against killing people uh, in the Bible. <laughs> And so most of them are pacifists as well. So they refuse to fight in the army and they refuse to swear oaths. And both Lutherans and Catholics conclude, therefore, that these are people who just cannot be trusted at all. And there's no use for them. And they don't like this kind of doctrine one little bit. And so they're going to join together in 1534 to go after the Anabaptists in the town of Munzer. And so they uh, are going to just round up a whole bunch of people and execute them working on the same side because they both can't stand Anabaptists. Uh, there's a famous story uh, about this movement, which has, it's never becomes a massive uh, percentage of people who are going to break with the Catholic Church, but they nevertheless have a sort of a, a small but significant minority of people who are going to follow one sect or another of Anabaptists. And they have uh, kind of heroic figures uh, in their kind of foundational stories, one of whom is this guy named Dirk Willems. Uh, he's Dutch, and this takes place in the Netherlands in 1569. And the story goes that he was an Anabaptist of one type or another, and he gets arrested because it was illegal. And he gets put in this like prison in his town, but prisons at the time were not necessarily uh, the uh, massive, mass produced, gigantic industry that they are now and so this prison was pretty ramshackle and there was a hard frost overnight and it, the ground heaved and the prison wall fell down so he's in this little prison and the back wall falls out basically so he's standing there and he looks around and he's like well I'm gonna run and so he turns and he takes off and he goes running across the fields 
And his jailer, who's responsible for making sure that he goes to trial, goes chasing after him. And Dirk Willems has been in prison for a while and he's pretty skinny. And he comes to a frozen river and he runs lightly across it and is on the other side. And his jailer comes crashing after him, trying to catch him and drag him back to prison. But the jailer is too heavy and he falls through the ice. And he's yelling and floundering and he's in the icy water and he's going to freeze or drown or something bad is going to happen to him. And Dirk Willems stops and he thinks about it. He's like, if I turn back, and and help that man in the river i'll be caught and if i keep running i'll get away but that man will drown so he decides as a good anabaptist who puts his morals above his personal safety to turn around and um help the man out of the river he does rescue his jailer pulls him to safety is recaptured put on trial found guilty and executed and i know and um therefore becomes kind of a martyr figure or indeed just a martyr figure for the Anabaptist movements uh, that are going to honor his memory. Okay, so it's chaotic. Lots of people are doing all kinds of things. You've got Lutherans, you've got Catholics, you've got Anabaptists, you've got Calvinists, you've got the followers of Zwingli, you've got followers of all kinds of people all over the place. So what is the Catholic Church going to do about it? In 1534, they uh, get together at the Council of Trent. And this is the big council meeting where they decide what they're going to do about this whole Protestant Reformation business. And at the Council of Trent, they come up with two basic decisions. The first is that they absolutely refuse to compromise on doctrine. All of the things Luther brought up about, um, you know, having the questioning whether the clergy have any special authority with God, they dismiss that out of hand. All of the things that he brings up about the inconsistencies he's found in Catholic teaching. They're like, no, 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 we're right. You're wrong. We're back down on nothing, nothing. But on the other hand, there's an acknowledgement that the Catholic church has not done as well as it should have done in terms of pastoral care, that they have not maybe provided the best moral leadership all the time, the most consistent, uh, the most uh, helpful and the most responsible uh, behavior among their clergy. And so there's a renewed desire or really sponsored by this reformation, this Protestant movement to clean things up, to impose institutional discipline and to clean up uh, clerical practices that are opening up the church for critique. So what the Council of Trent ultimately decides is number one, on the principle of the matter, the nature of Jesus, the nature of the church, the importance of the authority of the church, the relationship between the church and royal authorities, no compromise, nothing, none. We're giving in nowhere. But on the other hand, we acknowledge that there's been some problems and there's an effort to clean it up. On the political side, the guy who's largely going to be leaned on to deal with this problem, the Protestant Reformation, is Charles V. He's the Holy Roman Emperor. He's a member of the Habsburg family, and he's in charge of a huge swath of territory. I'll show you the map in just a minute. But he's in charge of a huge swath of territory. Not only does the Holy Roman Empire control big chunk of Central Europe, uh, everything that is now Germany, Austria, Hungary, bits of Poland, um, a lot of what is now like Denmark, the Netherlands, etc., all of that. Uh, not only that, that, but he's also inherited Spain. He's got the, the southern part of Italy and, and Sicily to control. It's, it's just a ton he's in charge of, a ton. Uh, and so he's trying to keep all of that in order while everybody is breaking with the church and causing all kinds of disruption and there's political factions and he's got a lot of problems. We're going to go through them kind of one by one um, and the major ones anyway in just a moment. But he has to decide what he's going to do about this. And so he ends up backing the Catholic Church and becoming kind of the military arm of the Counter-Reformation, how the Church is going to push back against those who want to uh, break away and leave it and do something else. In 1530, he demands uh, something called the Augsburg Confession, where he knows that he has some vassals who are following Martin Luther and who are interested in his idea, like Frederick the Wise, and who are breaking away from obedience to him, which he doesn't want, and also breaking away the Catholic Church. And so in 1530, he demands something called the Augsburg Confession. He demands that those vassals who wish to break away come up with a document that basically lays out what it is that Lutherans think and what it is they believe. 
And so this ends up becoming kind of the manifesto and blueprint for the Lutheran church, for the Lutheran movement, I guess. It's not a unified church for some time. Um, but really that process is formalized at, partly at the behest of the Holy Roman Emperor who just wants to understand what he's dealing with. What are the demands? What are the complaints? What are the beliefs? What's going on? And so in 1530, uh, a group of nobles and leaders. Luther is not able to attend because he's technically been banned after the Diet of Arms. Uh, he's uh, not allowed to travel freely anymore. He'll be arrested. Uh, so he can't come, but a bunch of his friends come and they lay out what it is that uh, this new Protestant movement believes. Charles is unimpressed. <laughs> And he's going to quibble back and forth. There's some argument about whether he might come to some kind of compromise. Eventually, it's it doesn't work out. And he declares kind of open war. 1541, after the Diet of Regensburg, uh, there's open war declared on Protestant groups in Central Europe. And any nobles that decide to back the Protestants and earn the wrath of the emperor. But Charles has bunches of problems. It's not straightforward. Problem number one, and possibly his largest problem of them all, the Ottoman Empire. They've been growing very steadily from the 1300s. The tiny map you see over there, it's not that tiny, but the, the little map you see over there on the bottom right shows the progression. The darker the color, uh, the further back in time that territorial control goes. So that part that's almost black uh, dates from about 1300. Uh, and then by the time you get to this point, by the time you get to 15, oh, let's say 1530 or so, practically all of that blue, uh, it, with the exception of the very, very lightest parts, are all under the control of the Ottoman Sultan, um, Suleiman the Magnificent in 1529, as it turns out is his name. They've controlled more and more and more territory. It's been gradually expanding for a, a few hundred years. And uh, the coast of the Mediterranean, starting uh, by Istanbul and then spreading from there along the coast of North Africa and then northward into Europe. The Ottoman Empire is at this point in 1529 pressing on the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire. They get as far as Vienna uh, with their, con their wars of conquest. And that is a major headache for the Holy Roman Emperor. This is territory that he claims for himself and feels he needs to defend. And so he has to marshal his forces to fight back and prevent the Ottomans from simply taking over his whole territory. And in order to do that, he needs the support of his vassals. And in the problem with getting the support of his vassals is a lot of them don't like the idea that the Holy Roman Emperor will control everything about their lives and become massively popular, uh, massively powerful. And so uh, they are going to some of them be breaking away and declaring the break with the church and refusing to defend the emperor and refusing to fight for him unless he comes to some kind of compromise, giving them more independence and more ability to do what they want to do. It's a huge headache for him because he's got this major military risk on his southern border that's putting tons of pressure on him then he's got the problem of france now the habsburgs at this point have inherited spain as well as the netherlands as well as southern italy as well as central europe right smack in the middle of that is france and so france hates charles v they hate the Holy Roman Emperor. They hate the idea that one family is going to control all of this. They hate being in the middle. It seems like a very dangerous situation. It could take over France at any time. They don't want him to succeed. They don't want him to become powerful. And so even though the King of France is Catholic, just like the Holy Roman Emperor, even though he has no desire to be anything but Catholic, even though he never even flirts with the idea of tolerating anything but Catholicism in his own country, he doesn't care. He's going to get in on these wars that we think of as religious wars, but they're really kind of not purely religious wars. They're religious and political and economic and social. Everything is involved and it's really quite complex. And if at any point during this lecture, or the next several, you think to yourself, man, this is confusing. It was very confusing for people at the time too. In many places, especially in Central Europe, it's, it's chaotic what's going on. Different political leaders get the upper hand at different times. Things change all the, go back and forth constantly. People are switching sides. It's really, really a difficult and really disturbed time in Europe. 
where a lot of things people always assumed would stay the same are not staying the same all of a sudden. Anyway, Francis I of France, uh, clever name there, um, he is Catholic, but he hates the Holy Roman Emperor more than he hates Protestantism. So he decides that he's going to do whatever he can to cause problems for Charles V. So there's a little bit of an attempt to use the French army to invade some of Charles's territory. That fails spectacularly, and poor Francis is captured. Um, in addition, France is going to decide that, all right, well, if that doesn't work directly, maybe what we'll do is uh, hire somebody to kind of play out this proxy war for us. Now, the Ottoman Empire, if you remember the map I just showed you, started by controlling Istanbul, but then began ringing the entire eastern Mediterranean. The effect of that is that they're controlling trade, the end of the trade routes from China and India, bringing in the luxury goods that Europe has come to love and treasure and savor, spices and silks and other wonderful things from the East. And if they control the head of the trade route, that means that all of the shipping in the Mediterranean of those goods uh, into uh, Southern Europe and then out uh, through the Straits of Gibraltar and around uh, the coast of Europe to the north, all of that has to go through the Ottomans. Uh, even the caravan routes come through Ottoman territory. And so therefore the Ottomans are in a beautiful position to impose high taxes on it. And they're in a beautiful position to defend and to demand and to make sure that this tribute gets paid uh, by really aggressively interfering with any other shipping in the Mediterranean. One of the ways they do this is through the use of, uh, I guess you could call them naval contractors, military contractors, known as the Corsairs. Uh, Corsair is sometimes used interchangeably with pirate. They're, so you could think of them as pirates, I guess. Um, and that's probably fair enough. But they're not just pirates working on their own behalf as independent agents. The Corsairs, sometimes also referred to as the Barbary Corsairs after the north coast of Africa there. Um, the Corsairs have a contract with the Ottoman Empire where they kick a cut of everything they take back to uh, the Sultan and Istanbul in return for the general sort of support and protection of the Ottoman Empire. So uh, they can sometimes travel under the Ottoman flag. They can sometimes uh, negotiate and trade. They basically are contractors that are, are hired more or less indirectly and totally unofficially by uh, the Sultan to make sure that tr the ships of, say, France and the Holy Roman Emperor and England and Spain and whoever else might want to sail ships in uh, North um well, yeah, the north part of Italy, etc. Anybody else who wants to do business in the Mediterranean has to either pay a hefty protection fee or risk their ships being boarded, boarded and their, their cargo stolen and uh, fall to the, uh, the um, aggression of pirates. As a result of this, naval trade in the um, Mediterranean becomes much, much, much more difficult and expensive if you're not uh, paying protection money. I mean, I guess it's more expensive even if you are paying the protection money, that's why. But um, it becomes much more difficult. It becomes much riskier and much more expensive. And so the Ottomans are taking a bigger and bigger cut out of it. Now, this is not a situation that particularly benefits France, but the Francis hates the Holy Roman Emperor so much that he's going to actually cut a deal with the Ottoman Corsairs to give them money and supplies and French support so that they can harass the Holy Roman Emperor harder than they would have to begin with. And that's a huge problem for Charles because this is what his territory looks like. He's Now all the green is his territory he rules outright. Now, if you were to draw an imaginary line um, from uh, that sort of green bit in the central Europe up to where the Netherlands are, roughly, um, that territory he claims, that's where you have what is now Germany and some of Poland, etc. Um, that territory is claimed by the Holy Roman Empire, but it's not ruled outright by them. Instead, there's vassals like Frederick the Wise, the Duke of Saxony, who are more or less calling the shots. 
But what happens is that because they're hostile to the Holy Roman Emperor, they're not facilitating his rule over their territory or his travel through theirs. And since Charles has inherited Spain and southern Italy and the Netherlands, and he has his own domain lands there in Central Europe, he has to try to rule all of this. But he's only one person, and he has to communicate across this land, across this territory, and there's a huge glaring logistical problem. If he wants to go from, say, Austria, right in the middle there, uh, over to Sicily or over to Spain or over the Netherlands, he has to sail. He has to send his messages by boat. That's the fastest way. If he wants to send troops, he has to send them by ship because the people who are in the middle aren't going to just let him march through. France is not going to let him march his guys through their territory to go bother people in Spain. He has to use ships. And so once he starts using ships in the Mediterranean, he runs into the Corsairs. It's an enormous series of headaches for him. And trying to control all of this at once is an uh, it's a virtually impossible task. It's something that is just one headache after another. And so what happens is that Charles uh, gives up after a while. He can't fight the Ottomans without the support of those vassals in Central Europe, without the Duke of Saxony, without uh, the Duke of Brandenburg, without all those people who are in the middle there. He needs them. And so he tries to force them back into Catholicism. He tries to force them into giving up Lutheranism and obeying him, but they resist. And because he needs their help so badly against the Ottomans, uh, he knuckles under eventually. And so he will come to a compromise with his vassals in Central Europe in order to secure their support so that he can do things like chase down the Ottomans, push their uh, sort of conquests backward, hang on to the territory in his southern part of his empire, and uh, be able to trade with minimal problems and communicate with minimal problems in the Mediterranean. So he had to give somewhere, and where he decides to give is on the religion issue. The whole process was deeply demoralizing to the poor guy. Uh, I, I mean, it's, I don't know how much you should feel sorry for him, but it was deeply demoralizing to him. In 1555, he's going to sign something called the Peace of Augsburg. And in the Peace of Augsburg, this is the treaty he negotiates with his vassals, where he says, all right, fine, I'll let you choose your own religion. And that's what uh, the term quios regio eos religio more or less boils down to, whoever's kingdom it is. So, and when he says kingdom, he means that very loosely. So if you're the Duke of Saxony, Saxony belongs to you, we'll call that your kingdom. Whoever's kingdom it is, his religion. That's what quios regio eos religio means. And so what this meant in practical terms was that if you were the Duke of Saxony and you decided you wanted to be Lutheran, you're allowed to do that. Lutheran or Catholic only. Those are the only two choices in the Peace of Augsburg. If you want to be a Calvinist or an Anabaptist, just forget it. That was not covered. But the compromise read that if you were the Duke or whoever and you wanted to choose Lutheranism, you're allowed to on behalf of your entire population. But Charles thought it would make more sense if people just did this by region rather than have each individual person decide what they want. Uh, instead, only the leader is allowed to choose. Only the duke, only the baron, only that person is allowed to pick the religion. And the Peace of Augsburg stipulated that if you were a person who was like, hey, I wanted to be Catholic and you find yourself in a Protestant uh, region or vice versa, then what you should have to do is move <laughs> to a different territory that had chosen the opposite. So the Peace of Augsburg allowed limited toleration. It allowed for the legal existence of Lutheranism under very limited situation, only if your political leader chose it. And individual people did not have the right to choose for themselves, or they did, but only if they moved, which obviously a lot of people are not going to want to do. Uh, but yeah, so uh, that's how the Peace of Augsburg work. It's important for a couple of reasons. One is that it is one of the first official legal recognitions by a Catholic monarch uh, Charles V, acting on behalf of the kind of, he's the military arm of the Catholic Church in essence too, saying, fine, we acknowledge that Lutheranism might exist and we can tolerate that without it having to be 
uh, eliminated on, you know, every second of the day. Fine, whatever. The other is that it represents the chaos and difficulty that uh, Charles is having trying to fight on multiple fronts in Europe all at once. He just can't handle it. This is also the beginning of how the Holy Roman Empire is going to fragment and fall apart in a kind of permanent way. The vassals that squeeze this out of him are not really ever going to be firmly under the thumb of any Holy Roman Emperor after this. They're going to be more or less politically independent. And that's going to be, uh, I guess, accelerated. I mean, there's going to be an effort, but this whole process is going to be accelerated by the fact that by the time we get to 1555, Charles is sick and tired of all of it. He's tired of the conflict. He's tired of the fighting. He's tired of all of it. He doesn't want to do it anymore. So he retires. He's like, I know I'm still alive and should technically be the emperor, but I don't want to anymore. So he retires to a monastery. He's like, I'm out. And I'm not going to pass the whole thing down to my successor. I'm not going to pass the whole thing down to my son. Instead, I'm going to divide the empire. Charles splits it uh, between his brother Ferdinand, to whom he gives the Holy Roman Empire, which is frankly kind of a political mess at the moment, Austria, Slovenia, Bohemia, and Hungary, which are kind of the domain lands that the Habsburgs inherit directly. Uh, his brother Ferdinand's going to get that part. And then the other part, which uh, Charles saw as the kind of richer and more, I, I guess, high profit and more high uh, potential side of his holdings, he gives to his son. Philip II is how he's going to be known uh, because there already was a, a Philip in Spain. But Philip is going to be the king of Spain. He's going to get the Netherlands, Naples, and Sicily directly from uh, his dad, Charles. And then over time, he's going to accumulate some other places as well. Um, England and Ireland, he's going to have access to because Philip, uh, just before uh, the Peace of Augsburg, is going to be married to the oldest daughter of Henry VIII, the guy who broke with the church in England, the one who had all those wives. Well, remember how he was uh, married to uh, Catherine of Aragon for a while, his uh, uh, Spanish wife, his first wife, uh, daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella? Well, uh, Philip is going to consolidate his hold over Spain uh, by marrying her daughter and the daughter of Henry VIII of England, Mary I of England. Now, here's what's happened with England. Um, what's happened is that um, Henry VIII did have one son, but he was kind of a sickly kid, Edward. And he only outlives his father very briefly. And he was quite young. And so nobody ever remembers he even existed. <laughs> but he briefly outlives his father and then he dies. And the question of succession is opened up. Henry VIII is dead. His son was sickly and died young. And his daughter, Mary, is next in line for the throne. And since she's married to the king of Spain... That goes through and he's going to support his wife in her claim. And so Philip is going to have access to England and Ireland through his wife. Technically, he's not the king. Uh, he's the, I guess, king consort, the prince consort. She's the queen and then he's married to her. But she was a traditional kind of lady and he gets to uh, control England and its resources as well as Spain, the Netherlands, Naples, Sicily. And then in 1581, we're not there for a while yet. He's going to get Portugal too, just because the king of Portugal dies and then the inheritance is complicated. He just kind of takes it over. So for a while, Philip is going to control a lot and it's a lot of what he controls is quite prosperous. That doesn't change the fact that lots of dynamic change is going on in Europe. So let's just pause and take a look at the map for a moment. Uh, this map is going to give you a vague idea of where there was religious change. So the lemony yellow color is where people are going to mostly stay Catholic in the great majority of cases. Then that darker color, uh, yellowy, orangey, mustardy color there, uh, is where you get Lutherans, uh, Lutheran strongholds. And you can see they're big kind of consolidated blobs, whole countries, whole duchies like uh, Saxony, etc. 
regions. And that's because in large part, uh, places that where people convert to Lutheranism, there's the support and encouragement of political leaders to do so. And so you have whole regions of people who are going to convert to Lutheranism kind of in big blobs. It doesn't mean there are no more Catholics in those territories. There are. Uh, but uh, what happens is that there's a, a strong uh, political and cultural incentive to kind of get with the program and break with the Catholic Church and become Lutheran uh, that's supported by political leadership. Then you get some interesting other stuff. Um, Anglican church is the green and that works kind of like the Lutherans. That's where Henry VIII broke with the church and then kept it kind of like Catholic light. So it's like the Catholic church, but the King of England is the head of it. And then really interestingly, you get these like blue fingers of Calvinism. And as you might expect, you see Calvinism in uh, Switzerland, especially in Geneva and places right around it is where some of those ideas are going to spread and where followers of Calvin are going to move in order to consolidate. But you also see these kind of like fingers of Calvinism moving through France. There's a reason for that. If you look closely and in the Netherlands and then Scotland's a separate issue, we'll get to that later in the semester. But um, the Netherlands and those fingers in France give you some indication about why some people convert to Catholicism. So are some people ver Ugh. some people convert to Calvinism and some people don't. They follow, if you look really closely, rivers and also the coastland, like in the Netherlands. These are places where people are concentrating in greater numbers in merchant communities. This is trade routes. And trade routes are going to be ripe for conversion to Calvinism for a couple of reasons. One is that they're big communication routes as well. And so the writing of Calvin and others is going to circulate through there more readily than elsewhere. In addition to that, uh, there are places where more people are literate, and so they're reading it. And that has to do with the second reason that you see these particular regions being hotbeds of conversion. And that has to do with uh, both the political and economic status of the people who live there. If you were a dirt poor uh, farmer peasant, we already talked a little bit about Calvinism's uh, principles. And they might not really appeal to you that much. The idea that your worldly prosperity might reflect whether you're in the elect or not is going to be a deeply unappealing principle to people who are struggling or starving or having a hard time or scraping a living. Uh, as a peasant somewhere, as a farmer, because that would imply that not only are you having a hard life in your life, but you're going to go on to not go to heaven, which is deeply unappealing. It is, however, going to be more appealing to people who are uh, middle class, I guess is the best way to put it. And this is can be a little bit misleading because we use that term now to include lots of people, people who do all kinds of jobs, uh, blue collar jobs, as well as white collar jobs. When I say middle class, and I'm talking about uh, the early modern period, really any time uh, up until the later part of the 20th century. When I say middle class, I'm talking about people who are reasonably wealthy, prosperous, certainly, uh, but are not part of the traditional nobility. They don't have titles. They don't own huge swaths of land. They're not, uh, they're not part of the, the governmental structure. So even though they have money and all the influence that that money can bring, they don't, they're not part of the traditional elite. And so they're, they count as middle class. These are people who are, are powerful merchants. These are people who are bankers, people who are the leaders of craft and trade guilds. Uh, so people who have a lot of influence tend to live in towns, tend to be able to read and write, tend to be able to afford the kind of austere living. It sounds weird, but it's not necessarily cheap to be able to live like a Calvinist because it means that you can't uh, do things that they would frown upon as unbecoming a Calvinist. So you can't be the kind of person who is scraping by and begging for food or anything along those lines. Okay, so at any rate, what happens in Europe, as you can tell from the exciting multicolored map, is that you have lots of different religious movements. They're all doing their own thing. There's going to be inevitable tension between everybody. Okie dokie. So... I'm sure you've been asking yourself, what's been going on in France? Well, let's talk about it. 
France after the disaster that was Francis I and he got captured by the Holy Roman Emperor and things went really badly for him and he was backing the Corsairs and he gets caught out on that and it just didn't it wasn't going great but France is looking on the it was looking up things were, were going well. Henry II had inherited France, and he was young and handsome, and he managed to restore some of the financial stability of France by uh, getting himself into an arranged marriage with Catherine de' Medici. Yes, those Medici from northern Italy. She's from that famous banking family. And this is going to be an alliance that goes on for some, well, more than a century uh, between France and uh, the Medici family in Florence. What they both benefit each other. What the King of France gets out of Catherine de' Medici and this marriage is a ton of money. What Catherine de' Medici gets is kind of access to real power that her family would never have had otherwise. So it's a mutually beneficial arrangement. It doesn't go perhaps as well as it might have. While everything is going great, while the king is young and handsome and athletic and doing things and married to his rich wife, he and they have three sons together and everything looks like it's going great, Things are good. But then Henry II uh, participates in a jousting match for fun, which kings should never do <laughs> because he dies by accident. And that leaves young sons who are too young to take the throne themselves and their mother, Catherine de' Medici, to serve as regent. The problem with this is that Catherine de' Medici's political, this is just my private interpretation, but Catherine de' Medici's political training seems to owe a great deal to the traditional politics of northern Italy. And if you remember how the Italian city-states dealt with each other, it was a constant backstabbing cycle of plotting and scheming and making alliances with people who used to be your enemies five minutes ago and then breaking those alliances in favor of alliances with other people and back and forth and playing two sides against a third. And it's just a lot of intrigue and plotting and scheming and um, trying to balance power and trying to cut your losses and trying to generally cover every eventuality. It worked fine in northern Italy for a long time. It's a dangerous game to be playing with national scale politics. And that's what Catherine de' Medici is going to do. Now, she feels like she's secure. She's got three sons. They're all in pretty good health. She thinks things are pretty locked down. So now that she's plunged into this new world in Europe where you have Protestants that are breaking away from the church uh, and there's all this pressure, some of her nobles are doing the same thing that some of the vassals of uh, the Holy Roman Emperor are doing and they're trying to uh, leverage their religious dissent and the people who support their religious dissent to try to get more independence from their monarch, from their king or emperor. So you have some nobles in France, not most of them, but some who are, are uh, going to break with the Catholic Church. Most of them are going to go Calvinist, actually and court the support of that merchant class I was just talking about, and then try to squeeze more independence away from the crown. Catherine realizes this is a problem. There's tension. There's potential war. She doesn't want that. She doesn't want dissent, uh, but she can't afford to let these uh, nobles get too powerful. But on the other hand, she feels like she wants to give them something to show that she's willing to play ball. So what she decides to give them is her daughter. Marguerite. Um, Marguerite is a princess. She was relatively politically unimportant because she has three brothers to inherit. And so for that reason, Catherine de' Medici decides she's going to arrange a marriage between Marguerite and the most promising Protestant, uh, Calvinist Protestant uh, political leader she can come up with. And the person that is chosen is a guy named Henry of Navarre. Navarre is that region between France and Spain that's kind of in the Pyrenees, the same way that there was Switzerland decided to break from the Holy Roman Empire way back at, right after the First Crusade when they started getting rich because of trade through the mountain passes. It's the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of religious separatism in this region, uh, driven by the same kind of social forces. You have merchant classes, tradespeople, townspeople who want to break away from traditional leadership, and they are playing in uh, 
the Protestant regions uh, in the Pyrenees. They're playing on a lot of local people's already pre-existing desire to be politically independent of both France and Spain. Uh, we'll talk about the Basque another day, perhaps. But at any rate, uh, there's a great deal of Calvinists. French Calvinists are known as Huguenots. You can see that word kind of right in the middle of the page there. Um, there's no real reason for this. <laughs> I mean, there is, but there's no reason you need to know. It's just that if you see that word Huguenot, all you need to translate that in your head into is French Calvinist. So they're Calvinists who live in France. At any rate, the, the most important of these is a guy named Henry. He's the king of this region known as Navarre, which is kind of halfway between France and Spain. And so he's a likely candidate for marriage. And so the marriage is arranged between the princess, the French princess, and the, the, the uh, prince of Navarre. This is not uh, a, a completely uh, popular move. Catherine arranges it because she's worried about Huguenots, French Protestants, French Calvinists uh, in the north of France. But uh, she realizes, or perhaps doesn't fully realize, just how unpopular this is going to be uh, among French Catholics, among especially Paris's French Catholic population. The great majority of France, before we go any further, you should know, the great majority of France is going to remain Catholic. Most people are going to do that. And in some places, specifically Paris, France remains super Catholic. Paris in particular is kind of the epicenter of the most radical, if you can call them that, uh, when they're not advocating for change, but they're the most strongly, militantly Catholic Catholics in France have their kind of foothold in Paris. And so... He, this is a little bit of a problem because traditional royal marriages between the royal family and anybody else took place in Paris. And so Henry of Navarre and his retinue, all the people who kind of accompany him places, have to travel to Paris for the wedding. This doesn't go great, as it turns out. There is rioting in the streets. There's an attempt to assassinate one of Henry of Navarre's uh, kind of friends and followers, Gaspard de Coligny, who was an admiral, and he was very highly acclaimed, and everybody liked him in the, in the Protestant uh, camp. Uh, you can see from this uh, woodcut, there's a man hanging out the window shooting a gun. We have guns in widespread circulation at this point. That's another major technological change. Um... So he's shooting at the admiral. There was an attempt to kill him. It fails. And so the admiral's retinue gets away and there's a chaos and there's some rioting in the streets. And there's a little bit of this, well, really a lot of rumor that starts flying through the streets of Paris. There was this an attempt to assassinate uh, the admiral. Possibly there was an attempt, this whole thing might have been a trap and an attempt to assassinate uh, Henry of Navarre, like a red wedding kind of situation where he was invited to Paris for this wedding of the princess and then he was all going to be slaughtered along with all of his friends and supporters. This was the rumor that starts flying through Paris and outside Paris into the rest of France and Protestant communities are getting angrier and angrier. And the whole thing looks like it's about to blow up in the Royal family's face. So here's what Catherine de' Medici does. They quickly rush through the marriage. They get everybody married off. So Henry of Navarre and Marguerite are married. That gets done. But then feeling exposed, feeling like she might be setting herself up for Protestants to riot and cause problems and strike back and have a deeper division with the, the crown than ever before, Catherine decides to make a preemptive strike. So she orders something called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and this was 1572. She orders her troops stationed around France to round up and slaughter all of the Protestants they can find. Most of these are Calvinists, but basically all Protestants. How this plays out varies from place to place in France. In some places, it's just the garrison. It's just French troops, part of the French army, rounding people up and executing them. In some other places, the army doesn't really do anything. Instead, townspeople are going to round up neighbors and start executing them. But 
whichever way it plays out, by the time everything is said and done, numbers, accurate numbers are a little hard to pin down here, but you're looking at probably around 15,000 plus people die as a result of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, just rounded up and slaughtered without any trial or, or any provocation that was just killed. And Catherine does this because in her mind, very likely, I mean, one never knows what a person privately thinks, but Catherine seems to have done this out of a fear that the Protestants were likely to do something in the future. Because she figured they would believe that she had lured Henry of Navarre to Paris to kill him. So whether she actually had done that and it just didn't work and it went wrong, or whether she just assumed everyone would think that, I don't know. But it's Medici-style politics that just blow up in her face. So she makes this preemptive strike thinking, ha ha, this will go great. And initially, there is, she gets some positive feedback. The Pope rings the bells of St. Peter's because he's so glad that all these nasty Protestants have been slaughtered. The King of Spain, Philip, remember him? was delighted. He's like, what a good idea you had there, Catherine. Good going you. What actually happens, though, is that for more than 20 years, France is going to be pulled into a horrifying bout of sectarian violence. Protestants and Catholics, because absolutely not all of the Protestants get caught in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Uh, some are going to survive. Others are going to convert afterwards, thinking, wow, if this is how Catholics behave, then I'm going to get off the fence and decide to go Protestant. Others are going to come into France from outside, from places like the Netherlands and elsewhere. And as a result, what happens are the French wars of religion. 20 bitter. Now, it's not like France is the whole country is fighting all at the same time. It's never like a major pitched battle. This isn't like a World War II kind of thing. It's sectarian violence, which means it will spring up in one town, fight miserably, people will be slaughtered. Sometimes there'll be a riot and, and dozens and dozens of people will be killed or hundreds of people. Sometimes it'll just be a church that gets burned down and then another church gets burned down in reprisal. Sometimes it's just a few people get murdered. It, it really depends. But it's this, it becomes this chaotic 20 year conflict where you have Protestants and Catholics just slaughtering each other back and forth and forth and back uh, in France. Massive disruption. And so you can see where Catherine de' Medici's attempt to play these Medici style politics on a national scale backfire terribly and they don't work at all. Um, and she also underestimates just how difficult it is to manage religious conflict. This isn't like political conflict. It isn't like purely economic conflict. It's the kind of thing that is much harder for people to accept compromise on, especially once they've escalated to the point of violence. Once you've killed somebody over an issue, and once somebody has killed a relative or friend of yours, in a sense, it stops being about that issue really quickly. Instead, it starts being about who killed who and reprisals and going back and forth. And so the, the violence becomes almost self-feeding and difficult to stop because once your family members have died, once your neighbors have died in a targeted way, not just like, oh, we all went off to war and some people happened to get caught in the battle, but had been singled out and had their house uh, set on fire or were burned to death in a church or were spent, you know, something like that, then it becomes enormously difficult for people to let it go. They can't. They're trapped in it now. And it's just vengeance back and forth. And especially if it's wrapped up in people's beliefs, it's just a, a, an almost impossible not to untangle. Philip, by the way, thinks it was such a great move, he's going to imitate it. So here he is, King of Spain. He looks across at France and it's like, yes, please, I think I'll do that. So in 1576, frustrated with the Netherlands, now he controls the Netherlands. And if you look at the map on the right, all of that, uh, it's not all the Netherlands now, but all of that was part of the Spanish Netherlands. They controlled it all, or both the blue and the green in that territory. There was some uh, both religious and political and social division inside the territory that Spain controlled. The northern part, the blue part, are places where a lot of people uh, made their living on merchant activity. 
And it was places where a lot of Calvinists settled and wanted to have their stronghold and wanted to see uh, religious change as well as political change. They wanted to, to be free of the rule of Spain and they wanted to be Protestant. And those two things were kind of rolled up together in their mind. And uh, they wanted to do their own affairs and mind their own business and, and be free to the south where it's green that's where a lot of people were farmers sort of traditional farmers and like most farmers across europe they're going to be much more inclined to stay catholic they have lower literacy rates uh, they have a general less investment in seeing um, major political change because their lives work the way they've always worked and, and they don't really see much incentive to to rock the boat so in the netherlands there was already a division and so the especially the blue part there had been making noises about independence and been resisting Spanish rule for some time. And since they also happened to be Protestant, uh, the king of Spain decides, ha ha, now is the time to force them into obedience. So he gives orders for something that comes to be known as the Spanish Fury. He sends ships to the Netherlands, a bunch of troops get off his ships and just start slaughtering people, just start slaughtering Protestants left and right in order to stop Protestantism in, it's his excuse for invading and trying to crush them back into obedience. Uh, about 7,000 people, uh, which is less than the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, but much more concentrated into a small area. About 7,000 people are just murdered, uh, just rounded up and killed as part of the Spanish Fury. And the brutality of this changes the equation in the Netherlands. Up until that point, the southern part of the Netherlands wasn't really interested in what the north was selling. They're like, yeah, 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 you want to be independent, whatever. I'm, really, I'm not really going to agree with you. But after the Spanish Fury, the people in the southern part of the Netherlands are like, okay, well, we're not going to convert to Protestantism. You're not changing our mind about that. But what we will agree with you on is that nobody likes the freaking Spanish. And so the Protestant North and the, the Catholic South are going to unite in order to create a, a, a unified resistance and independence movement against Spain. The leader of this movement is a guy named William the First, William of Orange, uh, also known as William the Silent. Um, he's Prince of Orange, and he ends up being the the leader of the Dutch independence movement. The Netherlands uh, are going to push for their independence from Spain. He's going to be assassinated in 1584, but his supporters are going to win. Now that they're united on one side, they're going to band together and they're going to fight fiercely enough that they manage to win de facto independence from Spain. Spain is going to take a long time to acknowledge that this is the case, but in reality, they sort of lose the ability to command the Dutch, who create the Dutch Republic. Now, you're probably wondering, what's going on in England? Okay, well, let's back up a tiny bit in time. So 20 years before the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, 1553, Mary, uh, the oldest daughter of Henry VIII and wife of Philip II of Spain, is going to inherit the country. She's going to inherit England and be the Queen of England. Now, she's only going to rule five years um, and those five years are not going to be peaceful ones. She was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. She was Catholic. She was, uh, well, mostly Catholic for a while. Well, we're not going to get into that, but, um, she's Catholic. Her husband is uber Catholic. Everybody's Catholic on her side. And so she sees it as her personal mission in life to turn England back to being Catholic. At this point, that's a difficult thing to do. There has already been political upheaval in England. Once Henry VIII broke with the Catholic Church, actual Protestants started streaming in and flocking to his side in order to try to carve out a political space for themselves as advisors to the king, as important nobles, etc. And important Catholics had fled the country in many cases because they wanted uh, to, well, they, they wanted to serve a Catholic monarch and it, it got kind of politically dicey. So when she comes to the throne, she's like, we're going Catholic again. There's already powerful people in play that don't want to see that happen, that are close to the throne. And so she has to deal with them. And there are also severely uh, strict and sincere Protestants who have decided that they broke with the church for reasons of conscience and they're not going to go back. So 
she has Protestants in England. It's not going to be a simple process to go back to being Catholic. She does not go about it any kind of soft and gentle way either. She declares that it's illegal to practice any kind of Protestantism, arrests about 300 people, which in the long term, compared to the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre or the, or the Spanish Fury, isn't really that much. Uh, but at this point, it was pretty shocking. Any sympathetic Catholic clergy, because there were, there were Catholics who were saying, wait, 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 don't just execute people. And she's like, well, you're guilty of treason if that's your attitude. So she rounds people up and has them burned at the stake if they resist her order to go back to being Catholic. This gives her the nickname Bloody Mary. Now, she only rules for five years. And if it had been more than that, she might have well been successful in just turning England back into being Catholic. But as it was, she had something like cancer, very likely, and she dies. And this begins the process of Philip II, the King of Spain's luck, beginning to turn. Because for a while there, everything seemed to be going his way. In the 1550s, uh, he had good control over the Netherlands. He had uh, access and control over England and Ireland. He had uh, control over Spain. He had control over southern Italy. He had all of these ducks in a row and things were going really well for him. In addition to that, we haven't talked about it, um, except for maybe the tiniest, briefest illusion. But if you remember 1492, uh, that was when the Alhambra decree was issued. We talked about that. But what I didn't mention or talk about is that's the same year Columbus goes on his big voyages for Spain. At this point, by 1553 to 1558, Spain is raking in money from their colonial exploration, conquest, and exploitation in the New World. And so all of this is under the umbrella of what Philip controls, and everything is going great until Mary dies. And that is a problem for him, because he's not the king of England, not really. He's the king consort. He only controls England through his wife. They don't have any children together. So when she dies, the throne goes to the next child of Henry VIII, Elizabeth. So here's Elizabeth. Elizabeth comes to the throne in 1558, and she is initially in a horrible position. It is really vulnerable. The treasury is empty. Uh, there has been so much political upheaval. There were Protestants under Henry VIII. There was deep divisions with under, under Henry VIII, too. There were Catholics and Protestants both mad. Catholics because he left the church. Protestants because he wasn't Protestant enough. Elizabeth is going to have those same problems because she's a Protestant very much in the same stripe as her father. She uh, is not a Puritan. You can tell by the outfit. She is not a Calvinist and not interested in becoming a Calvinist. She's not interested in becoming a Lutheran either because that has political implications and she doesn't want to do it. Instead, she wants to adopt this very mild form of Protestantism, which where the queen is going to be the head of the church and then things are going to more or less look like Catholicism. That's the, the kind of way she was raised and that's where she's going to go with it. She has this major problem, though. Number one, she's a girl. Number two, she's the daughter of Anne Boleyn, and half the people in England de declare that she's ineligible to inherit the throne because she's a bastard. Uh, she is. Uh, ha she has a treasury that, as I mentioned before, is basically drained and empty. There are conflicts with Scotland and France. There are all kinds of border issues, and half of the nobles are moving back and forth. I mean, you have the Catholics that came back under Mary. Now they're angry at her and she has to decide whether she can keep them on her side or whether they're going to turn their back and, and take over from her. They're going to actually be, during her rule, multiple assassination attempts, attempts to kill her outright in order to pass the throne to somebody else. Specifically, uh, the Catholics try to assassinate her a lot. And she has to figure out how to balance this and complicating matters is the fact that she's not married. So she doesn't have that political alliance already set up for her. And there's a reason for that. She didn't have a, normally by her age, uh, when she came to the throne and she was not old, but she wasn't, you know, a child either <laughs> by 19 or 20, she would have been married, at least would have had the contracts drawn up. But because her political system situation was kind of so awkward, uh, a match had not really been made for her. And then once she takes the throne, her situation doesn't get any less awkward. She's still kind of in between. And to choose somebody 
would be to declare for one side or another what she tries to do because she's in such a weakened position. The army and navy of England are very weak. The treasury is empty. She doesn't have a lot of options. Her political uh, clout is relatively low when she comes to the throne. And so she has to be very, very, very careful, like a tightrope walker, trying to find a path through the middle that doesn't offend anybody so badly they go into open rebellion. And so she has to really work hard at it. So what she decides is that she's not going to be in the business of uh, declaring that people have to be one religion or another. She learns that lesson from Mary. And under Mary, it was still possible because the majority of people in England at this time are still Catholic. There's no way Elizabeth can simply declare everyone has to be Protestant because it would be 60, 70, 80 percent of the population that would be in defiance. And she would absolutely win the open rebellion of all the Catholic nobles and all of the Catholic uh, clergy who support that. It just would never have gone over. But she has to worry about pressure from Protestants who want to see more Protestantism from her as well. What she does is very clever. She simply says that she's going to leave it to people's individual conscience. She's like, I don't care. Be whatever you want to be. I don't want to make windows into men's souls. Believe what you want to believe. But if you want to serve in my government, I expect you to take the oath of supremacy. And I've copied it out there for you there. Um, basically, the upshot, I'm not going to read the whole thing, is that you have to swear. I put your name here. Do utterly testify and declare in my conscience that the Queen's Highness is the only supreme governor of this realm and all other dominions and countries as well in spiritual and ecclesiastical things or causes as temporal and that no foreign prince, person, prelate, state, or potentate hath or ought to have any jurisdiction, power, superiority, preeminence, or authority, ecclesiastical or spiritual within this realm and therefore I do utterly renounce and forsake all foreign jurisdictions, powers, superiorities, and authorities. What she does... If you want to serve in her government, you have to take this oath that says, I swear that I will obey the queen and no one else, that I don't believe anybody should have authority over her. What this in effect does is it says that if you think that there's anybody who whose authority outranks her, like, say, the pope, You'd have to swear an oath otherwise before she'd trust you to occupy a job in her government. She didn't ask you whether you were Catholic, but if you were a hardcore, serious Catholic that really thought the Pope ought to uh, supersede her authority, then you wouldn't be able to take this oath. But it's entirely up to you. If you're kind of a softcore Catholic where you're like, well, you know, I'm willing to compromise, you can take the oath and we'll move forward. But that's kind of how she parses it. And then she's also extremely clever. Now, this is uh, one of her most famous uh, tricks and techniques. She's not married, as I mentioned. If she chooses a Protestant, Catholics are going to go bananas and possibly revolt. If she chooses a Catholic... The Protestants are going to abandon her, and they're the kind of the core of her supporters. She can't afford to offend either one. So what she does is she just dithers for years, where she holds out the possibility that she might marry one person or another. And by doing so, she manages to manipulate diplomatically a lot of the other leaders in Europe. So the King of France, for instance, is going to send his brother as a potential suitor for Elizabeth. The Holy Roman Emperor has a candidate. Um, the King of Spain, Philip. Remember Philip? He was married to her sister for a while and controlled England that way. He desperately wants to marry her. He wants to marry her super bad and hang on to all of those advantages. And she cleverly strings all of them, as well as a dozen others, along, where she'll entertain their ambassadors. She'll sometimes let them visit her. She'll talk to them. She'll be polite to them. She'll be considering their offer and all the while encouraging them to sweeten the deal, come up with a good trade deal, come up with uh, a, a promise to uh, make sure that um, her ships are unmolested as they trade along the coast, come up with some kind of a sweetener to the pot, some kind of a deal each time to make it clear that they are willing to seek her favor. Now, all of these countries, she's in a terribly vulnerable position, but 
they think to themselves, if we can just marry this chick, we don't actually have to fight a war to take over England. We can just have it for free. In essence, it'll be a great deal. It'll be a big boon. And so she strings them out for a long time, especially Spain, who wants her pretty bad. And she takes advantage of this situation the whole while. For instance, remember those corsairs that work for the Ottomans? She's going to do a very similar thing. Uh, with English pirates. Those are people known as privateers. So privateers for England, uh, they work kind of along the same lines as the Corsairs. What they do is they have this under the table deal with the queen where they uh, are going to sail around under a British flag. Well, it's not British yet. Uh, will be soon. They sail around under an English flag so that attacking that ship would be an act of war. Uh, it would be an act of war with England, and nobody wants to do that, especially the Spanish, because they're hoping to marry her. So they fly the English flag, doodle around, and then wait till they see a nice big fat Spanish ship loaded with treasure from uh, South America, for instance. And then uh, once they see that, they nip over the horizon, run down the English flag, put up the pirate flag, go attack the Spanish ship, take all the loot, sail over the horizon again, take down the pirate flag, put up the English flag and go sailing off. And whenever the Spanish object to this, because they're not blind or stupid, they can identify the ship later again half the time. Whenever they get caught out in this and Spain complains, and the, and the king of Spain does complain about this, believe me, he'll go up to Elizabeth and say, I'm paraphrasing here, you've got to stop with these, these English, they're, they're, these pirates are pretending to be English and they're flying under your flag and you've got to do something about them because they're a bunch of that lousy pirates and what are you going to do about it? And she would, in return, uh, clutch her pearls. <laughs> she was fond of pearls. You can see some there. And be aghast. I can't believe you would accuse me of such a thing. Me? And I was all set to marry you. But if you're going to be a jerk about this, I guess I just can't shockingly over and over this works she strings the king of spain along eventually he does lose patience then there's an incident it's one of several as i mentioned there were a bunch of attempts to assassinate elizabeth at one some of them very uh, like elaborate like at one point there was a poisoned dress seriously somebody sent her a dress as a gift and it was infused with poison uh, but she didn't wear it and so she didn't die anyway uh, somebody else wore it and did die but at any rate uh she has a spy master francis walsingham whose job it is to keep track of who's trying to assassinate her basically and one of the people he watches very closely is Mary, Queen of Scots. She's not Bloody Mary. People get those two mixed up. It's Bloody Mary's dead now. That She was the queen's sister. She's gone. Uh, Mary, Queen of Scots is a different person. She's the daughter of James, the King of Scotland. And she uh, has strong connections with France. And she's a Catholic. And... She's also a cousin of Elizabeth, so she's close in line to the throne of England. She's Catholic. She's a logical choice. She's the Queen of Scotland. And so Catholics in Spain and in France and elsewhere see her as a great opportunity. By backing her claim to the English throne, if they assassinate Elizabeth, she can take over and rule England as a Catholic. Yay! Yay! So that was the plan. That was the idea. There was a plot and a scheme. And Mary's uh, correspondence, her letters are intercepted and she's caught red handed plotting to assassinate Elizabeth. Walsingham argues uh, with Elizabeth, who was, hesitates about this. She was really quite reluctant. And uh, this was well documented that as long as Mary, Queen of Scots is alive, she's going to be a rallying point. Anybody who wants to get rid of Elizabeth and have a Catholic is going to um, have an excuse to try to kill Elizabeth and put her on the throne as long as she's there as an option. So Elizabeth, having caught her in treason red-handed, having caught her in an assassination attempt, decides, okay, fine, I'll have her executed. So in 1587, she is executed. 
At which point, Philip, who'd been waiting for this moment, the king of Spain, leaps forward and declares that Elizabeth is a lousy law-breaking infidel who is not uh, eligible to be queen. And the Pope backs him up on this because she's a lousy Protestant. And now she's executed a queen of Scotland, uh, a rightly sort of uh, sitting queen. And this was wrong and terrible and horrible and can't be forgiven. And it's a good pretext to invade England. And he calls out the arm. Armada. Armada is just the Spanish word for navy. Uh, he calls out the Spanish navy, which was huge, and the ships were enormous, and they were covered in cannons, and they were uh, really uh, the sort of cutting edge of naval um, warfare at this point, and there were just tons of them. And so he calls out the Armada, and he loads it full of uh, troops, army ground troops, because what Philip plans is a full-scale invasion of England. He intends to sail across the the channel, get to England, make landfall, get his troops off the ships, uh, kill Elizabeth and take over England and rule it himself. And he has the sanction of the Pope to do this. That's the plan. Doesn't go that great, as it turns out. Now, this was a moment of tremendous drama. Uh, Elizabeth was advised by her um, advisors. She was advised by her counselors to flee. They were like, look, you can't possibly beat Philip. His army is so much bigger than England's. Uh, his navy is so much bigger than England's. There is no way we can't win this. We are going to die. And it's you're going to fail. And he's going to win. And you're going to be humiliated and probably executed. And it's going to be horrible for you. Elizabeth uh, has a, a choice to make. And she decides, I'm going to go down swinging. I realize I probably can't win this, but I'm going to fight. We're going to fight to the last and we're going to do our level best to make this as costly a victory for him as we possibly can. And so she summons out the English Navy, which is not nearly the size or with the firepower of the Spanish, though she does have a fair number of pirate ships, in essence, that are smaller and lighter and faster and more maneuverable and still pretty heavily armed. So they have lots of cannons on them. She puts them under the command of Francis Drake, uh, who is the vice admiral, and he's in charge of this uh, naval defense. The Spanish are, even though they have quite a fantastic armada, don't have the same kind of quality of naval command. Their naval commanders are kind of, frankly, sort of inept. England calls on the Dutch. They're like, hey, you're our major trade partners and we have good relations and we're both Protestants and the Spanish, we both hate the Spanish's guts. How about you come out and help us? And the Dutch, in fact, do. They send out more light, fast, maneuverable, heavily armed boats to help with this battle. So England begins processing its defense. Elizabeth gets ready on land for wherever to go out and meet. She has some armor famously made for her, or she's going to go with the army and go out and meet the Spanish wherever they land and make a final dramatic last stand. It's going to be great. So she braces herself, but she does this fully expecting they're going to lose. They're going to do everything they can, but they really think they're going to lose this whole situation. But then Very famously, the Spanish lose their advantage. They have the upper hand and they lose it quickly. The English are going to use a bunch of techniques uh, that are very effective. They already have lighter, faster ships. They are more maneuverable and the Armada struggles. They have this huge array, this huge flotilla of, of boats and they rely, as all ships do at this time, on line of sight for communication. The only way, because there's no radio, there's no, uh, you know, telegraph, there's no nothing you can use along those lines. The only real way to communicate from one ship to another is in the daytime, you can use flags. And in the nighttime, you use basically lanterns like uh, to make a, a flashing light signal to communicate from one ship to the next. So the Armada is moving in formation. They're trying to stay together, but they are, they're purely sailing ships, so they have to use wind power only. Uh, they don't really have a motor. They can't kind of cheat at this. They have to maneuver these big, ungainly ships and keep them kind of in formation. And so they're under the command of a couple of naval commanders who, frankly, aren't that bright. I'm going to skip the details, but basically they fall into a series of traps, and the English ships are going to harass them and harry them and drive them kind of to the point where they scatter and then there's a major night attack that drake organizes that where he uses what are known as fire ships you take some relatively disposable ships 
ones that are in poor condition or are already damaged or are relatively small. And you pack them full of gunpowder and other explodables and anything that might burn. And then you take a skeleton crew out with the ship until you can get in striking distance of the Spanish. Then you uh, tie the rudder, uh, jump into the light boats, and then light your packed full of gunpowder ship on fire with the rudder kind of tied so that it's going to just drift into the path of the Spanish ships. And of course what happens is these ships explode into flaming balls of fire and they just are kind of drifting into the path of these other sailboats. Well, it's not very easy or fast to maneuver these giant Spanish ships. And so they all have to like work in an emergency frantic uh, drive to get out of the way of the fire ship because if the fire ship hits them, they too will catch fire and that will be a disaster and they go blunder into other ships and it could get really, really bad. And so, some Spanish ships are going to be taken out by the fire ships, but the bigger consequence is that it drives the armada apart. And once they're driven apart, it's night, there's smoke, there's all this fire from the ships, they can't see each other. And so their attack plan is utterly disrupted. And they end up getting kind of chased and harassed up the coast of England on the um, well, it's the uh, east coast of England, as it were. They're chased up the coast toward the north. Now, some of them are going to double back and go, try to go around uh, toward France again. But a lot of them are going to keep going north with the idea that they'll sail around the northern end of the British Isles, uh, the, the Orkneys up there, and come down around the outside of Ireland to try this attack landing again from the other side. They're going to kind of rendezvous and come from the other direction. So the battle in the fire ships causes disruption some ships sink the rest of them are harassed they're all driven apart they're sailing to the north and as they come around the northern tip of england uh into the north sea there's going to be a massive massive a series of storms that blow up now the english ships weren't stupid enough to follow them up there they've kind of regrouped to form a defensive uh barrier back toward the south and so what happens is that the spanish ships have totally and completely made a rookie move they have forgotten how far north the north end of england is i mean they didn't literally forget they knew where they were going but uh i don't know how many of you are familiar but the british isles are actually quite a bit more northerly than we are on our latitude here uh, just because of the way the gulf stream moves uh, it's warmer in england than it would be at an equivalent latitude in north america uh, so the uh, we're at roughly at the same latitude as italy the north part of england uh, and well the north part of the british isles which is technically scotland um, is really far north the orkney islands up there are in the arctic circle or practically there and so the Spanish were utterly unprepared. They go around, they get into this bad weather, the ships flounder and they are rocked into the coast along the Irish Sea. The storms drive them onto this very dangerous coastline and they smash and smash and smash and smash. Uh, more than a third of the Spanish uh, armada is going to sink as a result of this conflict. And that is massively devastating, not just because the ships themselves are hugely expensive and valuable and they crash and they sink and then all of that stuff is lost, but those ships are loaded with Spanish troops. So this is a doubled military cost. It's taking down the army and the navy in one. And after all of these storms blow up and the Spanish are smashed against these rocks, they can't do anything else. And they end up just going limping back to Spain with the strength, the kind of backbone of the Spanish navy broken. And the consequences of that are going to be massive down the line. Because up until this point, the Spanish were dominating Atlantic trade. They just were. They were dominating uh, colonial claims in the Americas, both North and South. They're not going to be able to do that anymore. Instead, it's going to open the door and it's going to create a little bit of a power vacuum that England is now, when they were on the brink of utter destruction, sitting pretty in a beautiful position to take advantage of. And they are going to take advantage of it. So France is in the middle of wars of religion. Spain just tried this armada thing and it failed. Now that leaves the door open for England to start becoming a bigger power. Okay, so back to France. Now <laughs> that we've enjoyed this time. 
one after another of those sons of Catherine de' Medici dies. They die, and then the next one dies, and then finally, in 1589, Henry III, who was the last of them, is stabbed to death. He's assassinated, and he dies. And so, after that, there's only one person in line for the throne. Marguerite de Valois, who's their sister. And she's married to Henry of Navarre, the Protestant. This causes a massive amount of consternation among the French. They've just been fighting these wars of religion, uh, Protestant versus Catholic, uh, Calvinist versus Catholic, Huguenot versus Catholic. It's all the same thing. And here they finally have Henry of Navarre is going to get France by inheriting it. He's the logical uh, person in line for the throne. There could be some disputes, but after the long series of wars, it's there's nobody who really can form a, a sort of concentrated and uh, resistance to his inheritance. However, Henry is a practical guy, and he realizes that something like 70 to 80 percent of France is still Catholic, possibly even more. And he realizes that it's especially in Paris, the stronghold of really, really militant Catholicism is never going to let him be crowned the king uh, without massive violence and bloodshed. And so he decides in the interest of stopping the war, in, a, in the interest of stopping the violence in France, that he will convert to Catholicism. He's like, I'll be Catholic if that's what it takes to inherit the throne. So he does that. But one of the first things he does is issue the Edict of Nantes. The Edict of Nantes basically says, if you are, uh, well, it's limited toleration. We'll talk about it in detail when we do our reading discussion. It's going to be part of our major reading discussion for this week. But basically what it says, the upshot of it is, as an individual, this is what makes it different from the Peace of Augsburg, you can choose your religion according to your conscience, and nobody can tell you otherwise. Now, it's not complete tolerance, and it's not complete uh, equality for both religious groups. He has to throw the Catholics a bit of a bone here, too, and he's going to reinforce their status in France. We'll talk about exactly how in discussion this week. Uh, but the Edict of Nantes offers more toleration on an individual basis than any other legal text uh, in Europe up until this point, issued by one of the major uh, rulers of a, an important country like France. So the Edict of Nantes is a document offering religious toleration. And the goal of it, the purpose of it, was to stop the violence. He's going to bring an end to the wars of religion in France by issuing this edict. Okay, so that more or less wraps up where we're going today. Um, just as a quick recap, Philip of Spain has had been having some ups and downs. There's been lots of political uh, vacillations in Europe. Uh, from 1568, you can see onward, he's going to have a whole bunch of uprisings that he manages to brutally repress. He crushes Moriscos. Moriscos are people who were uh, Muslim in Spain and then uh, kind of forced to convert to Catholicism and he and are dissatisfied politically. He's going to crush them when they try to rebel. Uh, he's going to have some victories over the Ottoman uh, Corsairs. He's going to absorb Portugal in 1580. Those are all bonuses for him. But as you can see on the other side, things start sliding downhill. The Dutch Republic manages to really assert its independence. Um, the Armada is attempted and is crushed, which really deals a terrible blow to the army and navy of Spain. And then in 1589, Henry of Navarre comes to the throne of France, who is a political and uh, philosophical enemy of his. And so things are looking down. And this balance of power has begun to shift and it's going to continue to shift. And we're going to talk more about it next time when we go through another series of thrilling wars and conflicts and exciting stuff that's going to happen uh, in Europe as the Reformation, Counter-Reformation, and then ongoing aftermath marches forward. Okay, so that's it for this week. Thanks a lot. Bye.